Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. HN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, aka the Football History Dude, and I'm coming to you from the headquarters of sports yesteryear, the Sports History Network, where we have 30 plus podcasts all covering various sports history moments for you. So you got to go check us out over at sportshistorynetwork.com. And what you're about to listen to was audio engineered, put into that little scientific baked oven and remastered by the man, the myth, the legend, audio extraordinaire, Don Coyle. So please enjoy this episode of Mask a Silly Question by your favorite heel advocate, Ariel Gonzalez. Enjoy. This episode is dedicated to two highly influential Franks, the late great podcast host and friend Frank Redding and the late great radio show pioneer Joe Frank. The minute I walk into my psychotherapist's office, she asks me where I've been this whole time. As I am now three months late for a 10 o'clock appointment we scheduled 15 Mondays ago. I tell her I kept hitting the snooze button and overslept. She's not buying it. Her office is a lot different than I remember it. Mural of Mexican wrestling legend Mill Maskers has replaced the blue and white attention-grabbing accent wall that once reminded me of a Parliament light cigarette ad. My happy place when therapy sessions got too intense. My happy place on New York City subways when subway slashers owned the night. Tacky, and I mean tacky, masked luchador pillow covers have replaced the bright yellow throw pillows I used to hug during crying jags. What's with the pro wrestling decor, I ask her. The room looked a lot better when it had a subtle mix of warm and cool tones. She tells me the newest trend in therapy is therapeutic decor. All the cool psychotherapists are doing it. The Lucha Libre wall art throw pillows are meant to ensconce me in the wrestling world, an environment of comfort and safety. Do you feel comfortable and safe? She asks, and I immediately say, no, not at all. Exactly the opposite. This is freaking me out. She then dons a wrestling mask I instantly recognize as the masked superstar mask. No, perhaps this will do the trick. It's a professional grade mask made of gray spandex with thick black trim around the eyes and three black stars on the crown. In a flash, her nimble fingers tie the laces on the back of the mask. When the mask is snug on her face, She directs me to look into her eyes. She intends to hypnotize me. Highly susceptible to hypnosis, I quickly fall into a trance. And for the second time since I walked into her office, she asks me, Where have you been this whole time? No longer able to hide in a Parliament light cigarette ad, I look to the accent wall behind her for a hiding place. Anywhere she can't get access to my memories. I take refuge in a barely noticeable wrestling ring, tucked in a far corner of the Mill Maskerous mural. I wipe my feet on the ring apron so I don't track any dirt onto the ring, but also as a show of respect to the ring and all who've wrestled in it. How do I know to do this? And why am I doing this? My goals here are concealment and subterfuge not reverence and cleanliness. 
My entrance into the ring was met with a smattering of applause. What? Who did that? Even though it's too dark to see out into the arena, to find the source of the applause, I know I'm not alone. The place is packed to the gills with wrestling fans. Why are they here? Where have you been? Where have you been this whole time? She's found me. Seeking refuge in a wrestling ring was a mistake. I should have looked for a, a Mexican embassy instead. But who would think to paint that into a mill mascarous mural? Bob Ross? And his opponent, hailing from Brownsville, Pennsylvania, at a height of six foot three, weighing 291 pounds, the Mass Superstar. The Mass Superstar is wearing his signature one shouldered black singlet. I can tell it's truly him by the reddish brownish locks flowing from the back of his shiny gold mask. His startling aqua blue eyes beam with intelligence and conviction. He plans on dispatching me as quickly as possible, as the masked superstar is not known to suffer fools and amateurs gladly. I am in awe of this man, as he is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time, ranking right up there with Blackjack Mulligan and Abdullah the Butcher. My awe is mixed with fear of what the masked superstar may do to me. The fight bell dings, and I suddenly have a strong urge to urinate. To my surprise, we circle each other in the ring, mirroring each other, sizing each other up. How I know to do this is beyond me, but I'm doing it. Gosh darn it, I'm, I'm actually doing it. We circle closer to each other now, both of us within striking distance. Then it happens. We are suddenly face to face in a collar and elbow tie-up. My hand is on the back of his neck. His hand is on the back of mine. It occurs to me to shoot my forearm into his face with enough force to break our lockup and send the masked superstar stumbling backward. He didn't expect me to do that. And neither did I. Now that he looks stunned, I rush toward him with no particular plan in mind. I'm operating on pure instinct. Should I try a shoulder block or a clothesline? I do something that is basically a very lame cross between the two moves. Sensing my indecision, the masked superstar raises a leg that lands right in my midsection. The boot to the belly makes me double over in pain. Wasting no time, the superstar puts me in a front face lock, lifts me off my feet, and suplexes me onto the mat where I land on my back with an earth-shattering thump. Muscles, spasms, rack my whole body. All he has to do is pin me for the count. I won't try to get up. Whatever fight was in me at the start of this mismatch is gone. It's truly over now. But the mass superstar is not finished with me. Not in the slightest. He sits me up and applies a sleeper hold from behind me. I want to tap him on his arm to signal my submission to the referee, but I, I can't find the, the strength to even do that much. The superstar's grip on my neck is so tight I can smell his forearm. It smells like an earthy blend of sweat and sweet vanilla-like tobacco. As I try to lift my arm again, the superstar says, We're putting on a show here, idiot. Stay put. And now I can remember one of the reasons why the Mass Superstar is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. His voice. His voice was always even-keeled, business-like, natural, and unaffected. During his promos, he could even be soft-spoken and deferential to his opponents, acknowledging their skills and accomplishments, sincerely, without being overly generous. Listen to what he said about Bob Backlund during a promo shoot for an upcoming title fight in 1983. Backlund, I'm going to give you credit. You're a good champion. A very, very good champion. You've held on to that belt for some time. But what you don't understand is, I've been planning for this for 10 years. 10 years I've been in this professional wrestling vocation. Very, very successful. Oftentimes not 
but always a winner. This was a title match promo. Who says that? Most opponents would have been ranting and raving. Backlund, I'm going to rip your arms off and beat you with them. But not the mass superstar. Credit. I'm going to give you credit. And that's why I enjoyed listening to mass superstar promos. He was easygoing, but still intense. I imagine if he slowed it down any more, it would be hazardous to operate heavy machinery. But he found the right tempo and stayed confident. It was the kind of confidence that allows an athlete to give his opponent credit without being seen as a wuss. His promo skills weren't the only thing he had going for him. The masked superstar had pure scientific wrestling skill. A true ring tactician through and through, the masked superstar broke rules when he wanted to, not because he had to. He should have been the WWF champion, but it never came to pass. It was the Hulk Hogan era and Hogan's reign was a juggernaut. Never a believer in the cult of Hogan, I pinned all my hopes on the mass superstar. To me, he was the true messiah of the WWF, ready to usher wrestling into a new era of greatness. There was no real reason the mass superstar couldn't have beaten Backlund to become the WWF champ, even if it was just for a short transitional stint until Hogan assumed the crown. In the end, it really all came down to who was more detestable to fans, an America-bashing Iranian sheik or a ring-savvy, cool-headed, masked man who spoke with the grace of a true athlete. Of course, we all know the Iron Sheik became that transitional champion, instantly dropping the belt to Hogan to begin the rebirth of wrestling. Sometimes there's a price to pay when you're not hateable enough. But look, it's not like the mass superstar didn't get a chance at Hogan. On the night of February 18, 1984, in the Philadelphia Spectrum, Superstar and Hogan fought in a title bout for the WWF Championship. It was a lackluster matchup, to say the least. Small contests of strength between them at the outset of the match were spliced with a lot of Hogan mugging for the crowd and a lot more Superstar walking outside the ring to regain his bearing. This could have been a great match if they tried to make it a nail-biter of a fight. Instead, they settled on Hogan chasing Superstar in and out of the ring, trying to unmask him. Fed up with Hogan trying to remove his mask, the masked Superstar just walked out of the ring and back to the dressing rooms, calm, cool, and collected. If it were anybody else, the walkout would have seemed cowardly, but not with the masked Superstar. Coming from him... The walkout looked classy, as if he were saying, Hey, did you come here to fight or unmask me? Enough with the gimmicks. And stop mugging for the crowd, damn it. Unmask him. Unmask him. A familiar voice from the ringside. It is the late, great Frank Redding. My friend from the Sports History Network boxing podcast, Ringside with Redding. I want to tell him it's pointless to unmask him. Frank, everybody knows William Reed Bill Eady is the mass superstar. And I've forgotten how to say the word pointless. So when the word comes out of my mouth, it sounds like disappoint us. Clearly, a temporary hypoxic condition is setting in my brain. It was Frank who got me into podcasting. Frank, who gave me a CD of The Mass Superstar against Blackjack Mulligan so I could research my first podcast topic. I must have watched that match a million times. And in it, Blackjack managed to unmask The Mass Superstar the way Andre the Giant had ungloved him once upon a time. The referee lifts my arm to see if I'm still alive, and my arm drops even though I want to reach out to Frank. Shake his hand. Tell him how much I miss his friendship. Where have you been this whole time? I'm speeding down a tunnel in my mind, and I wind up in a Catholic school gymnasium sometime in the mid-1990s. I'm in a wrestling ring again. But this time, I'm next to the great Mexican champion, Tito Santana. Tito was gracious enough to be in a Polaroid photo with one of the residents of the group home, 
where I was a counselor. The three of us smiled as we held Tito's championship belt aloft. After the snapshot, I had a chance to sneak backstage, or what passed for a backstage anyway, at a Catholic school gymnasium, and meet Bill Eady. In addition to being the mass superstar, Eady was also Axe, one half of the tag team known as Demolition, the WWF's answer to the legendary Road Warriors. Like the Road Warriors, Demolition adopted the post-apocalyptic fashion and attitudes of the Mad Max movies. The Road Warriors were badasses, while Demolition looked like runners-up at an S&M costume party. Edie was packing a spiked leather axe guard into some kind of duffel bag. His silver makeup covering his face looked runny and mildly irritating. And there again... Same mingled odors of sweat and tobacco emanating from his pores. Edie probably wanted to get the hell out of the gymnasium as fast as he could. There I was, standing a few feet behind him. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Axe. Were you the mass superstar? I asked. Still busy stuffing heavy duty spiked clothes into the bag and not bothering to turn around, Edie replied, Yep. You were great. And I think you should have been the WWF champion, not Hogan. When I said this, he stopped packing and said one thing and one thing only. Politics. Amazingly, I didn't ask any dumb follow-up questions. We just let the word hang there. That one word explained everything. Edie zipped the duffel bag with finality. He meant it as my cue to leave. The fan encounter was over. And suddenly, I'm back in the wrestling ring, where the mass superstar is slowly choking to death as the ref lifts my arm a second time to see if I'm still alive. I see my father sitting ringside, too, a mere few seats away from Frank Reddy. My father has lost interest in this match. He's playing dominoes with a few of my gruff Perth Amboy uncles. After studying his tiles for a long time, my father wraps the domino table to signal he's unable to lay down a tile. The play passes to one of the many uncles wearing sleeveless motorcycle denim jackets. My father looks up and makes eye contact with me, visibly angry and ashamed. He yells out to me in Spanish. Mira, nene, quítate esos malditos tacones. Los tacones altos son para mujeres. Translation. Take off those damn heels. High heels are for women. My uncles break out in laughter. And for the first time since I entered the ring, I stare down at my feet and notice I'm wearing a chic pair of Lulu's Gwendolyn Red Suede Lace-Up High Heel Sandals. To appease my father, I stretch forward to unwrap the long laces tied above my ankles. The ref lets my arm go as I stream forward. My arm stays aloft from the effort. supposed to keep your arm up on the third arm. Not the second. Don't you know anything about pro wrestling? The mass superstar is pissed. I raise my arm too early. As I reach forward for the heels, I inadvertently lift the mass superstar to his feet as well. He barely holds onto my neck. The sleeper hold loosens, and I jab an elbow to the superstar's gut that makes him double over. I really want to take these heels off, but the laces are wrapped so tight around my ankles, it's like untying a pretzel knot. Now I'm hopping in on a high heel foot. I struggle to remove the other shoe. The crowd is laughing as they pelt the ring with crumpled paper cups and half-filled beer cans, one of which lands square to the side of my head, pushing me over the top of the ring and into my psychotherapist's office, where I'm wide awake, sitting in a chair, staring at the accent wall behind her, the sexy mural of Elvira, the buxom mistress of the dark replaces the Mil Mascaras mural 
Off my surprise, my psychotherapist says, my 12 o'clock thinks she's a witch. I nod and look down at my feet and see a pair of men's leather boat shoes. I thought I was wearing high heels, I say. You were. You can take them off and put them on whenever you want to. Time's up. So, is that it? I ask her. The answer to where I've been this whole time, the Wizard of Oz message, I never really left Kansas. Happiness was with me the whole time. But this time on my feet? Not quite as simple as that kind of a fortune cookie with a dog. You are in a sleeper hole. But I broke free, I say. The revelation makes me smile. Just before I exit, I stop at the threshold to say, I promise I'll never be late for another appointment again. She says, I know. I will see you in two weeks. You have been listening to Hustling with Ilson. The musical loops used in this episode were all found on Looperman, a royalty-free music site that promotes loops and other cool sounds. Check them out. You've been listening to Wrestling With Heels On, only on the Sports History Network. Hi, everybody. Dan and Andrew from Hello Old Sports here. We wanted to drop in and let you know about our latest episode. That's right. We interviewed the co-authors of Phyllis George, Shattering the Ceiling, a biography of groundbreaking broadcaster Phyllis George. And her life is really sort of a journey through 20th century America, from Miss America pageants to the Kentucky State House to the groundbreaking NFL Today show on CBS, even the Kentucky Colonels, the old ABA. We got into all sorts of stories about the Celtics under Red Auerbach, about the interview with Roger Staubach, about really all sorts of things, a fight between Brent Musburger and Jimmy the Greek. We really enjoyed talking with Lenny Shulman and Paul Volponi, who teamed up to write this book. The book is on sale right now wherever books are sold. You know, within reason, garage sales, probably not. So go ahead and pick up a copy today. And if you want a chance to win the book, you can go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash giveaways and register for a chance to win. Goodbye, old sports.